Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak, and I want to apologize to the audience for being a person of the last century and not giving a slide talk or whatever <laughs> more fancy fancy talk. So, um, so I hope you can read it. And so that the, the topic is about um, the rank donis thomas theory of a certain color bio threefold, and in some sense it's a degenerate color bio threefold. So in some sense, ideally you would want to study color wave threefolds which are strict, so which have h1 of your color wave threefold should be, should be zero. And you obviously see that because of this elliptic curve, that's not true here. Okay? So this is some sort of, you can say, some sort of degenerate case okay? of, of, the, of what we should expect in the, in the kind of in the true sense. Okay? So, so the reason to study this anyway is in some sense that um, and that from this degenerate case, you might still learn something for the general case. And then the second thing is also maybe just the personal motivation that is kind of, in this kind of degenerate case, you ex actually can really give complete explicit formulas, and that's kind of very satisfying in this, in this field, I mean, at least for myself. Okay. And so the second thing I want to say is that um, the talk will be slightly technical, but I thought it, it fits well because it kind of um, uses a lot of the techniques that also will be discussed in, um, in Richard Thomas' talk. So, so I, hope, um, I hope that is uh, also useful in some sense. Okay, so. And yeah, if there are any questions, just start. So I want to just recall a little bit, recall this, what is the standard setting? Okay, so if you have a smooth projective threefold, then we'll just do the really the, um, really classical don case of curve counting Donis and Thomas invariants. So we look at what is called this Hilbert schemes of curves. Okay, so this parameterizes um, closed or one dimensional subschemes of this X and we'll ask two conditions. So the class of this of this uh, one dimensional subscheme should be this curve class beta. And then the, the, the structure sheaf, sorry. And then uh, we also um, put a condition on um, uh, the structure sheaf, and we, we also fix that the, uh, the third churn character of the structure sheaf should be n. Okay, and so maybe as a warning to I don't know who follows usually this talks, it's a little bit different convention, but yeah, don't worry about it. It's it's equivalent to just fixing the holomorphic Euler characteristic of the structure sheaf. Okay, and so uh, another way to view this, I mean, if since this is a school, it should just say this is the same as the mo modulus space of Giesecker semi stable sheaths with respect to some polarization of this, this uh, with churn character specified by this data. Okay. And so then we learned in, in, in uh, Richard's talks that there's a, a perfect obstruction theory, and let me just write it out one more time. So there's this, uh, you, you look at this look at this universal sheaf, which I call always E in this, in this, in this case. Okay, so you have this universal sheaf on this, on this product of Hilbert schemes times this thing, and you look at the map to the Hilbert scheme, and then you look at this, um, the, the, this relative home between, this, uh, between the sheaf and itself, you push it forward to the Hilbert scheme, then you still shift it, and then you uh, take this trace-free part, then to really get this map to the to the cotangent complex of your of your model, of to your Hilbert scheme, you just still have to dualize. But yeah. Kay. So so in particular, this obstruction sheaf. I mean, forget about all of this. The obstruction sheaf of this of this obstruction theory at the point corresponding to this E will be just this x two of this sheaf, and then the deformation space. So to trace this x two, and then the deformation space will be the trace this x one. Okay, and so in particular from this data, you you get this you get this virtual fundamental class. So let me just put it here. Uh, well, so from this data, you get this virtual fundamental class of this Hilbert scheme. So I drop this uh, this data here. So this will be Chow class in the virtual dimension of your Hilbert scheme. And here the virtual dimension is just the I mean just First churn class integrated over this bit. Okay, so if x is color by r, um, then you can define the dt numbers um, of your space 
just by integrating, taking the degree of this virtual fundamental class, right? Then Carl Bayer means C1 when this virtual class vanishes, and then you just integrate. And really, the challenge, I would say, a challenge in the field is to compute explicitly, compute it explicitly, explicitly for a strict couple of for a strict, strict, uh, strict, compact color by 3. And here strict is this, this condition I put here. Okay, so for example, quintic threefold, um, compute this number. And so, yeah, so let's consider this degenerate case that I discussed. So, and so now, uh, I mean, that's kind of very unfortunate notation-wise, but I will not call my elliptic curve E, so, but in some sense I have to call it E. So I will call it like this double E, okay? So I hope that doesn't confuse any, everybody, anybody, okay? So I, I think it should be clear whether this, what is the sheaf and what should be the space, but yeah, if not, then just interrupt. And so on this, on this thing here, uh, if you just use this naive definition I just wrote up there, it's just zero, okay? And the reason for that is, I mean, there are many ways to formulate it. One reason is that there's a cosection, okay? So there exists a cosection. Exist, it's the glo globus cosection, cosection of the obstruction space. So of this of obstruction space. Sheaf. So there's a map sigma from the obstruction sheaf. So, um, sorry, I should say here, of the space, to uh, so to the trivial sheaf of, of the Hilbert scheme, and we ask it to be surjective. And so, how do you define this uh, this gl global cool section? How can I get this board down? How would this So, okay, so uh, that's kind of part of this general, th this cosection stuff I think will be also discussed in this, in all these lectures will kind of play a role. So I want to prove this vanishing um, by constructing a cosection. In some sense, there are two ways to this, and let me just sketch them. And the second one is kind of closer to what we will do later, and it's kind of um, maybe more clear what happens. So, so the, the, the first one is um, really goes back, I think, to Buchwald's Flanner, the semi-regularity map. And then I guess there's also some work by Maulik, Pandel, Pandel, and Thomas. And then I guess even farther back, you can trace this back to Bloch and so on. Okay. And so the idea is the follows. And, and the idea is to, well, what do we have to do? We have to find a map from this obstruction space to a trivial to a trivial sheaf. And so let's look at this guy here. Um, so this is, uh, yes. Why, we, why, why the existence of global cosection is important? Is, uh, why, why you need this? Yeah, so because it will prove that all the Donnes and Thomas invariants are v zero. And at the same time, we'll, gi we'll give you a way to fix that. So actually define your non-zero counts, okay? So, so I will just uh, ask you to wait a minute and then I will, I will kind of state this conclusion. Okay. So the first thing is to find this core section. And in some sense, this core section should be some sort of trivial piece in this obstruction sheaf that doesn't play any role for, for deformations and obstructions. Okay, okay anyway, so, um, so, so how does it go? So, well, let's look at the sheaf E. So let's say look at the fixed sheaf of this obstruction space. And um, and so how do you find the core section of this guy, right? So how do you, and so the idea is to use a certain gadget that al also already was in introduced. So I, I'm, I take it, I can say that I can use it. So so there was this Atia class, and so you just apply this Atia class here to the x3. And then you take the trace. Okay. 
So here's the idea class, and then take the trace, and you, you land in a certain cohomology group, H3 of x comma omega x. Okay. And so now you have to do this Kuhn decomposition in your head, because uh, what is this space here? Um, so x is this product. So this will be H2 of isomorphic to H2 of the K3 surface, structure shift of the K3 surface, plus H11 of this elliptic curve. Okay, and so so here there's a and so this is in particular this means unique. There's a unique sim uh, dual of symplectic form, and then the point class. Okay, so that's really just the, the one-dimensional space. So I didn't tell you what is. I mean, I don't know. We didn't discuss much what is the Sitter class. Just a way to a uh, certain natural class associated in this cohomology group, and associated to do it, you can you can write down this map. And so the way to show this is really subjective. I mean, I said we really want to, to prove a subjection. The way to do this is some sort of calculation that I want to not discuss too much. But one way to do it is really construct an element in here that you can show goes to 0 here. Okay. And so the way to do this is you, you look at, uh, you, you pick you pick a H1 in a cohomology class in, this, in a certain group, and you take it in here, and then you can calculate ca calculate the image under this map, and I will not discuss how to do it, but the image will be this certain thing. Okay. And so then you can show that if you take this v correctly, this will be non-zero. So, so what is the no sorry, it's a bit fast, so I didn't notice, so this is, w e is the, what is the w e there? Ah, sorry, so there's the point class. I mean, I want to take a generator here, which is the class of the point on the elliptic curve. And I want, I'm saying if you take the class of point of elliptic curve and take the dual of uh, the complex conjugate of your symplectic form, multiply them together, this gives you a generator of this, of this space, and so the generator of this space. And this notation, this, uh, this V inner product, what, so, sorry, in the very left, Yes, please. I'm saying you pick any v here, and then you take the interior product with this Atia class. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, all of this is not important. The way I'm, I mean, I feel this is the most natural way to understand this core section because somehow, if you look at the model space of K3 surfaces, there's a certain divisor, uh, so this moduli of K3, there's a certain divisor with this class beta that we started with here. So, so here I fix a, of course I fix a class beta, um, let's say class beta comma d inside the Hilbert, in, inside H2 of x, and so I identify this with H2 of your K3 surface, plus H2 of your elliptic curve. So here's the beta and the d. And so there's a certain divisor in this model space where this class beta is algebraic. Okay, and so here, so here I ask this beta to be in fact, if better to be algebraic, so um, in so uh, so I should say one one of s comma c under Poincaré duality. Okay, so sorry, I'm I'm kind of messed this up. The the order up of these things. So uh, Atia class is kind of uh, twisted by some three form. Is it uh, so? This one or what? Anyway, so sorry, this so uh, essentially what this says is that, so you have your point, so here you see kind of the, the, the divisor where this class beta is algebraic, and somehow you have this point here of this K3 surface. If you take an infinitesimal deformation of this K3 surface, which is given by this vector v, then somehow the um, obstruction to deforming your sheaf along with it is exactly given, I mean, sorry. Um, so. Then if you want to try to deform this uh, sheaf along, there's a certain obstruction, which is coming from the fact that this churn 2 of this sheaf should stay algebraic. And uh, the obstruction to, to, to that is really given by this, the, by this group. So, so in this way, you can prove this is not zero. OK, maybe I, I did the kind of a very bad job at explaining this. So let me give you the second way to construct this cosection, which is actually much more easy to understand. Okay, so the second one is 
uh, using the action of the elliptic curve on your on your model space. Okay, so we have our model space. Um, here, and so so in particular, if you have a if you have a, a, a sub scheme, you can just translate it by this action of the elliptic curve. And so, in particular, this gives you a, a map um, from the tangent space into uh, into the the first X group of your of your of your sheet. So now you can just uh, how I say. You can just uh, I mean, look at this in a sheaf way. So, I mean, look at this in a relative sense. So you get get the sky, get a really a sub bundle of this guy, and now by shared duality, so we are uh, we have so this is isomorphic to to the dual one, and so now by shared duality, this produces you this cross-section. Shared duality produces you then this, or by dualizing, you you get this cross-section. So omega e. Okay, so because you have a sub you get a quotient. Does that make sense? Maybe that's that's clear. And so so uh, why do we do this? So then once you have that, then there's this uh, this. Uh, Result of Kim Lee. It tells you two things. The first thing is that there exists. Um, so the first thing is that this virtual class that we defined with the, with the standard obstruction theory is just zero. And then this uh, this is kind of the first statement. And the second statement is there exists a, uh, a way to fix this. This is called this reduced virtual class. So this this guy here will live in 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 uh, in uh, the usual virtual dimension uh, plus one of your model space. Okay, so the virtual dimension in our case was uh, zero, so so it lives in a um, it's now a one-dimensional class. Okay, so. so and so so this class is then really non-zero often, and I mean. In most cases, and you really get non-trivial DT invariance out of this. So, so the definition here is the following. So you, so you want to now define DT invariance of the space. Uh, so this x cross e. Then you just uh, integrate over this class. And you integrate. Um, a certain certain insertion, so um, so a certain cohomology class, natural cohomology class on it, and the way to do this again is using this using the universal uh, um, uh, uh, universal um, uh, let's say universal uh, uh, sub scheme in this in this thing. So there's two maps to X and to the, to the Hilbert scheme, and what you do is. So you have this two projection here, and what you do is you you pick a class gamma, and the cohomology um, of your x, and then you define this insertion tau zero of gamma, which is just given by pulling back this t x by uh, to this thing, taking taking the cup product with the churn uh, churn two of the structure sheaf, and then pushing it forward to two. To 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 the to the Hilbert scheme, okay. and so here what we do is we just take tau zero, and um, in in some sense it doesn't matter really what you take. Um, the the most convenient thing is to take you pick a class beta dual in the H two of your K three surface, such that the pairing with this given curve class beta is zero, and then you also tensor it with this. This class that I defined up before this this point class. Okay. <laughs> and so in an essential way, I mean before in the usual Kalbel threefold, somehow there was just a single number that governed everything. In this case here, uh, essentially this is the single number that governs uh, all the curve counting in this 
for the Hilbert scale. Uh, so the cross section is where in this conjunction? Cross section comes in here through this reduced virtual class. So, so come, kind of um, with the cross section, I know that this vanishes, and then Kim Lee also tell you a way to fix that. Okay. Are uh, these two cross sections are the same? Yeah, they are the same. And the construction depends on the choice of the cross-section that's reduced? Yeah, up here, yes, yes. I mean, up, well, yeah, so in some sense, so the, the reduced virtual class uh, only depends on the K-theory class of your, of your um, perfect obstruction theory. And somehow it doesn't really matter which kind of trivial piece you subtract from this cross-edge. So in some sense, it doesn't matter which one you take. Um, but uh, yeah, it's good to fix one. I mean, it, uh, the reason we, we need one is to, to have this first statement. <coughs> okay, so what's the theorem? And so, so basically there are two parts. And kind of the first part is, I guess, a uh, more exciting one, but the older one, and let me just still state it to, for completeness. So this old result. Um, together with uh, Aaron Pixon and then Jun Yang Shen, and it says if you take beta to be primitive, so beta is our class on the K3 surface, um, so, so that will be always primitive, so let me just write the Picard group here. So, so this is primitive um, um, of square, of square, 2h minus 2, then this dt invariant is easily computed um, as follows. Um, just given as a certain coefficient, so there's a sign here which doesn't play a role. And then there's a certain coefficient of this, of this Igusa cusp form, uh, one of this Igusa cusp form. Okay, so, so you take this one over this Igusa cusp form and then you subtract uh, you extract a certain coefficient here, a Fourier coefficient of this Igusa cusp form. So you take h minus 1, q tilde, d minus 1, and then p to the n. Okay. And so here the q and the q tilde are the Fourier coefficient, uh, I mean, associated to tau and tau tilde. So q is e to the 2 pi i tau. And then the same for the tildes. And then p is the e to the 2 pi i over z. And this guy here, this fellow, is this. Um, this E Gusa cusp form. So there's a certain Siegel model form of genus 2. It's a, it's a cusp form. Um, yeah. In some sense, as, as nice as this discriminant mo model from delta of tau just now in genus 2. So if you, if you have any model form textbook, somehow you can just open it and, and you find this guy. And so, now, today, I just want to explain the second part to this theorem. So this is maybe, yeah. um, and this just tells you what to do in a, in a general case. Okay, so in a general case, you have this certain multiple cover formula. And it is stated as follows. So um, that essentially you can, so here this beta was primitive. And so we can always reduce to this primitive case. Okay, so the. The way to do this is you, you sum over all the. Hmm? What is primitive? Yeah, means it so. So beta is an element in this lattice, and uh, so uh, it's primitive if you can't divide it by any in positive okay. integer bigger than one in this in this lattice. Okay, so, so the primitive case is somehow easier because uh, yeah, your curves are can, you can control them more. But it turns out in this K3 surface case, the imprimitive one is uh, in fact controlled by the primitive one. Okay, so the way this works is you sum over the, um, all the devices of the GCD of this beta and this n, and then you have a certain sign here which is uh, given by this uh, n plus n over k. And then we have a 1 over k here. And then you just get a primitive invariant here. Okay, so, um, so for the Euler characteristic, you just divide by this, by this k. And then for the curve class, um, the d doesn't change. So the d doesn't change. And then 
Here I want to really take beta over k, but beta over k is not primitive, so I, I didn't gain anything. So instead, I just assume it is primitive. Okay. So, so let me just say what is this prim here. So. Um, so where prim over beta over k is a primitive effective curve class curve class on some k3 surface as prime uh, of same square of square given by this uh, of square uh, um, equal to the square of this, of this, of this um, class beta over k. Okay, so you just take your beta over k, you assume it's a primitive class of the same square on some other k three surface. You you calculate take the corresponding um, d, uh, dt round determined by maybe part a, and then just just plug it in. Does that make sense? Okay, so so I'm saying here I take beta tilde, which is um, so I take so take a beta tilde. Uh, so this is a algebraic class on some K3 surface, and let's say positive. So there's actually a curve in there, um, such that such that the square of this class is the same as the square of this beta. And then uh, I, I, the prim of this of, of beta over k is I uh, want to define to be this beta beta. Tilde. So is that as prime any other k tree with that property, or you really construct this surface? Yeah, any other any other, it doesn't depend by deformation invariance. So somehow if you have a k three surface with a primitive algebraic class of a given square, then any two of these guys are deformation equivalent. K cannot be two. Because beta squared is 2h minus 2. I mean, if, if k has to divide beta here. OK, so otherwise it doesn't matter. Yeah. OK, so anyway, so this determines everything. OK, so what is for this, for this geometry in, in, uh, in rank 1? OK, so maybe I. Okay, so maybe I can make some remarks about this. Uh, yeah. some remarks and, and short history. So the first one is um, uh, about uh, yeah, so about this problem. So so maybe there are three remarks I can make. The so the first one is if d is equal to zero, then uh, so d, d is the degree over the elliptic curve, right? So so we have our k three self elliptic curve here. Then we have a we have a s here, and so if d is zero, so d is the degree over the elliptic curve. So if you then all your curves are somehow vertical, so just um, live in in this k three fibers. So in this case, this this uh, statement just reduces to the k three surface, and and uh, then somehow there are like uh, three res results that one can state here. So if beta is irreducible, this goes back to Kawaii Yoshioka. And then if beta is primitive, there's this, I mean, this was then done by Maulik, Pande, Pande, and Thomas. And then beta imprimitive. This was done uh, then by done by Pande, Pande, and Thomas. And so let me just make also a remark for beta bigger than two, uh, so strictly bigger, then just this part b, um, so so part b, b for divisibility two, um, was is also holds also was done by follows by work of uh, Yang Han Bei and Tim Tim Bu uh, on the Gromov-Witten side. So we don't know for imprimitive beta. We unfortunately don't know any 
we don't know the Gromophin PT correspondence yet for the space, but um, yeah. on the Gromophin side, you can independently prove this. And so then uh, the final thing is the higher rank. You can ask for the higher rank, and um, this is uh, yeah, still work in progress, but I think this also can be done eventually. Um, the last one for the mm. then they prove for three. So yeah, so but on the Gromophin side, you can just do product formula, and then this B is kind of a consequence of this of this um, multiple cover conjecture for K three size. So how much time do I have? Uh, hmm? Half an hour. Ah, okay. Uh, I didn't want it. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so for the last half an hour, I will just try to explain the proof. And or at least the key idea in the proof. And, and sometimes, um, this follows closely somehow ideas that already been used here and also show up, um, will show up a lot in this, in this week later. Okay, so let me just discuss the proof. Okay, so proof on your part B. And so, so how do you prove such a thing? Okay, so, and so the idea is, uh, well, we have this S cross E and you have to break something, and what you break is always the elliptic curve here, also. Okay, so, so the first thing is you degenerate uh, the elliptic curve. Okay, so, so you have the smooth elliptic curve, and you degenerate it to a nodal elliptic curve. And then you can, so this is just, you view this as a P1, where you glue these two points together, and then, uh, there's all this business about the degeneration formula. Um, with the degeneration formula, let's you reduce to um, then K3 surface times P1 relative to two fibers. And then with some other work, some more work, um, so um, plus uh, um, then you can actually just reduce to the case where your uh, K3 surface times P1 relative to one fiber. Okay, so degenerate elliptic curve and reduce the, to this relative DT theory, theory of, of the surface time P1 relative to, to, this, um, to the fiber over zero. So here S0 is fiber. Yeah. And so I will not discuss this, but um, this is kind of standard technique. And, and don't worry about the relative DT, it will kind of disappear in a second. Okay, we'll we just reduce the problem in absurdity in, in the end. Okay, so this is the kind of the step one. Okay. And then the second step that you do is always you localize. Okay, so you look at this geometry, you look at this Hilbert scheme, uh, S, cr S cross P1, and then you take S0, um, and then you, you localize. Okay, so you take GM. And uh, yeah, so essentially there's three different fixed loci one has to consider in this in this um, in this relative Hilbert scheme. So this one I call the extreme one. I haven't told you what it is. This one is what is called pure rubber, and this one is some sort of mixed guy. And in some sense, for us, what will turn out is that. Um, the second and third one will not contribute at all. Okay. And that's, uh, most of that is not hard to see. Okay, so let me first tell you what are these three components. Okay. So what is this A component? And A will be the one that is kind of most important for us. Okay, so let me just write it in some uh, picture schematic ways. So these are subschemes or curves inside really surface times P1 of the form. Um, so, so here you have the fiber over, over zero, that is your re relative divisor. And um, so here's our P1, here's 
I mean, our, my picture is three-dimensional. So. Okay, so here's so here's our K3 surface. Okay, and so um, so these are kind of really the um, yeah. How shall I say this? Um, the fixed curve that really live inside just the surface times P1. Okay. And so how does it have to look like? So you're relative over zero, so so nothing can happen over this five over zero. So here you have really just straight straight lines, maybe thickened or something. And that meet this uh, meet this five over infinity. Then at the five over infinity, you have all kinds of uh, fixed fixed curve here. Okay, so you, you can have some sort of fixed curve here. Or maybe I should use the same color. Okay, fixed curve, fixed points. Okay. Localization occurs at the infinity. Yeah. So if you have the scaling action on the P one, so the C star, we use the GM action or C star action on this P1, just scaling the kind of this parameter. And then you have uh, two fixed points, zero and infinity. And somehow if you have a curve inside surface times P1 that is fixed under this action, then you can have some vertical components over, z over zero, some vertical components over infinity, and then just kind of uh, essentially straight lines between them. And uh, the ones over zero we cannot have in this, in this, in this component because we ha have this kind of condition that we're relative to this zero. And so if you, if you uh, write this out, really you can, I mean, say it even more precisely, this picture is kind of bad. So, so this are really the ideal sheaves um, in this geometry, such that if you restrict this i to um, surface times uh, p1 without this fiber of infinity, and this is just pulled back from, this, from, the, from, from an ideal sheaf on this, um, uh, of ideal sheaf of point on this on this S. Okay, so here, so how do you say? So where uh, eta is a zero-dimensional subscheme, subscheme of length d on this S. So just to short form notation, the model space is the Hilbert scheme of d points on the surface, and so eta is just a point. Okay, so if you take this ideal sheaf. Of our thing, you restrict to away from this fiber of infinity where all this stuff happens. Um, I mean, the screen stuff happens. Then you just get kind of this uh, straight tubes here, which means it's just the, the corresponding subscheme is just a preimage of this of this um, uh, fixed zero dimensional subscheme of the surface. Okay, so this really a low side that sits inside the Hilbert scheme of this surface times p one. Um, this so in this absolute absolute model space. And so yeah, let me also look at the, the other two. So B, what is this B? So let me also just draw a picture here. Maybe C first. Okay. And I draw this for the people who know it, this relative stuff. Um, and so in the C you just everything happens over this um, over this over this rubber component. And okay, so here you have the original P1 here, and then here you have some sort of rubber component. Um, so where you it, it's like a P1 where you ad, where you identify curves when they differ by a GM scaling, and then you have some sort of stuff here, and then here you on this side you just have straight lines. And so this is this component C. And then component B is kind of a mixed, mixed, mixed mixture of these two things. So you have some uh, some green stuff here, and then you have this uh, this straight lines, and then here you have some some stuff happening. Okay. Anyway, so these two components doesn't matter, and somehow uh, the whole whole action ha happens on this A here, on this part. And so this is the guy we have to understand and uh, try to try to make sense.
Are there any questions uh, about anything? Can you explain again what is different from BSC there? Yeah, so, so C, uh, in C, I really want to say there's no, the, the only curves that are allowed in the surface times P1 is just, uh, um, uh, are just pullbacks. I mean, the corresponding curve is just the pre image of this zero dimensional subscheme on under S. So it's just like P1 times the zero dimensional subscheme. So there's no, um, yeah. Uh, there's no vertical components in any way. Yeah. On the other hand, here I ask the I mean, allow stuff here and then also stuff here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so we have to understand this extreme component. And somehow the techniques are um, essentially uh, that this is. Uh, well, no, and in some sense, so, and, and what's nice here is we're on this surface times, um, well, let's say we're on surface times P1, but what really matters here is this, this part of a, a, away from zero. So really, we can just view our sheaf also just restricted to the surface times A1, where A1 is this, is P1 without the, without the zero point, okay? So, I mean, our, the data of this curve is somehow totally determined by just restricting away from the zero point because there's just, um, yeah. Um, so so in, in fact, we can just work on the surface times A1 here. And so, so the way to do this is then the following observation. So this is kind of textbook uh, algebraic geometry. So if you have a current sheaf, um, current sheaf on surface times A1, this corresponds to um, yeah coherent OS of T module on the surface, and then um, if you uh, and so so the way this to do this if you have a sheaf here on this threefold, you can just push it forward. Okay, and so this gives you then this OS of T module on this, this thing, and then if you also ask it to be GM equivalent. This corresponds to on this side uh, to saying that this sheaf should be graded. Okay, so grading um, with respect to this T is just uh, the same as uh, having this GM equivalent structure. So in particular, if you have that, you can can just write your your push forward as kind of a direct sum of this the sheaves. Okay, and then there's this feature that we look at coherent sheaf. So at some point this this kind of direct sum has to stabilize. Okay, so we have some e r minus one t r minus one, but then we have e r t to the r, and at, at this point, it becomes stable. Ah. Okay, so so here's the point of uh, which I call a point of stabilization. Of stabilization. Stabilization. And so this multiplication by t here, I mean, gives you maps here between the skies here. Um, t. Okay. And you can show that, I mean, now, now it's kind of that if you're flat over this A1, so if you take our ideal sheaf, this will be always flat over A1 because it's torsion free. And so this will correspond to the fact that uh, t uh, from this EI to EJ is injected. Okay, so really you have injections here. If you start with a flat sheaf, then you have a flat over A1 injection between these two things. So in fact, everything of here just corresponds to um, also finite filtrations. Filtrations. Um, yeah, on, on, this, on this S. Finite filtration of current sheaves. And so the way to go about this last isomorphism is just sending this to this, this inclusion. So, so this is kind of the, I mean, I guess, uh, standard, standard uh, tool. Okay, so how much time do I have now? Sorry for that. Okay, so, okay, so now I should uh, somehow. Um, 
So let me uh, still say some words about this d equals to zero case. Okay, so the d equals to zero case is this this classical case. Okay, and so um, in this case, the the Hilbert scheme, uh, sorry, this this component A here that we had, is just this nested Hilbert scheme. Okay, and so the idea here, so the idea to solve this, uh, and determine our invariance in this case, so this is the idea of PT, is to consider this uh, our obstruction theory, and um, so obstruction theory of our Hilbert scheme, and restrict it to our fixed component, and take the fixed part of this thing, and then observe that this has a second obstruction theory. So um, should have, so uh, should have, um, so, so maybe I put it here. Construct a second second uh, core section for for this fixed part of the obstruction sheaf restricted to this to this component. Okay. And so from this you get that most components most comp components vanish. And so in some sense, it's kind of very natural to expect such a thing in, in hindsight, of course. And the reason is as follows. So uh, if, you, if you think back to the beginning of the talk, some of the obstruction theory by part one was kind of uh, constructed by thinking about this class beta and kind of trying to deform your K3 surface to a loci where this class beta is no longer algebraic. So now in this fixed loci, um, we have not just a single class beta, but we have the churn characters of all of these sheaves here. So we have kind of R plus one sheaves here in this in this fixed loci, and they have all kinds of churn characters. So in particular, um, I mean we already use this reduced class, so we know that somehow we cannot touch the churn two of this of this sheaf E. So this kind of global churn character is kind of uh, we have to keep algebraic, but we are free to kind of move all of these individual uh, churn characters. Um, I mean, uh, I mean we have we have no condition on these individual churn characters. So in particular, if you have some, some guy here which has a churn 2, um, which is not uh, linear dependent to this, to this uh, class beta, we can just move our K3 surface to some place where this class is no longer algebraic. Okay. So in some sense, uh, if you look at this thing, you in some sense uh, expect that you should get R plus 1 different cosections. Okay, just by this kind of intuitive thing that now, to get a non-zero number, you just don't have to protect the algebraicity of a single beta, but you have to kind of keep all of these churn characters algebraic under deformation. So that's kind of in theory. In I mean, already this argument allows you to kill a lot of this term. I mean, not a kill a lot of these contributions. The issue that is that what happens, what may happen, is that the churn character of these guys could be all kind of linearly deep dependent to this uh, class beta that we already have. Okay, so this argument is not compl quite uh, sufficient. Okay, and so instead, what they do is they consider this guy here. Um, uh, I mean, the structure sheaf. So in this case, d equals to 0, we have, um, we have uh, I mean, our p1. Or so in uh, case d equals to 0, really, everything happens over, over this a1. So you have just the sheaves here, okay. And so in their case, they look at the sheaves, and then because of d equals to zero, um, at some point you hit this this case where you stabilize, and then what comes afterward is all zero. Okay, so you just get zero at some point, and then they kind of do something amazing, which is that they construct explicitly deformation deformation of this OZ, so of OZ over this over some field of dual numbers, this yields you a yields you a tangent vector. So so from this you get a tangent vector inclusion in this X1 pi of E E. And then um, yeah so I should put a T here. And then again, by this by the shared duality argument, we we um, we get the cosection. Okay. 
Hmm? What is T here in the Yeah, it should be the torus weight. So, I mean, in some sense, uh, on surface times A1, this is uh, Calabiao, but equivalently it's not Calabiao. So, so some of this is this T. So, I just forget about it. Okay, so. And so, so this really uh, very nice uh, geometric construction is gives you ex additional tangent vector, additional deformation, and then it produces you this. So in our case, we have to go to D positive, and then there are somehow two issues. The first one is you really have to work with the deformation theory of surface times P1, so you're not color by Yau. And then the second issue you have to deal, is deal with is that your sheaves, your, I mean, in our case, the, we don't have the zeros. In our case, the zeros uh, still stay the structure sheaf of our, our, our zero-dimensional sheaf eta. So we have kind of this additional terms here floating around. And then we have this non-Calabial thing. And then, so anyway, so you have to solve, kind of uh, try to extend this argument to the surface times v1 case. So this is what I tried to explain in the last 10 minutes. Is there any reason to take this dual? Why this? Why dual numbers? Uh, why you, uh, this is non obvious? No. I mean, it's, it's you have to, I mean, you have to, I want to construct a tangent vector, and the tangent vector in a, so what's the tangent vector of a scheme? It's a, I mean, it's a, I, I mean, in a model space, is in the civil scheme, it's just the sub scheme over the x cross the, the dual numbers. Yeah. Anyway, so so this is kind of a very nice argument, second second tangent vector, but uh, we kind of do something more more uh, more direct. I mean, more stupid. So. Hmm. Hmm? How do you know it's a different cross section? Yeah, so this is, uh, I didn't mention this here, so I'm going to try to do this first. <coughs> so they proved that this is a, a different cross section if and only if your, if your OZ here is uh, uniformly stacked. So meaning that, so I should have said this. Um, so this is different if and only if. Um, so, so, uh, yeah. So, so this this gives gives the same construct, same core section as before, if and only if all of these guys are are the same. Okay, so all of them are the same, and then your curve really looks like a fixed curve with in the same structure. And if you if you if you have one of them different, then you get a new cosection, and you get a vanishing by the scheme Lee method. Okay, so okay, so now. Okay, so th there's kind of, uh, I think, uh, two observations here. So, so let's do the general case. So, so let me just rewrite this line that I just erased. So this is our sheaf here. So now E will be our ideal sheaf in the surface times P1 or A1 for simplicity. Okay, so it doesn't matter. So this would be, and so we have this the non-trivial stuff, and then we have this stabilization guy. Uh, so t to the r, t to stabilization point. Then we stay stay the same, and here we get this ideal shape of this it. Okay. And so the first idea is to, I mean, okay, this looks kind of complicated. I mean, so, so you have kind of this non-trivial stuff here. Nevertheless, you can just view this. You can, in some sense, just cut it here in this the stabilization point and just view it as a filtration um, where you take E0 sitting inside E1 and so on until ER minus 1 and then you have ER so ER is this this guy and you just add a, a trivial piece OS here okay so there's a natural unique map here and this is just OS is just C right it's the ideal shift of this 
to just see. And in fact, that's a, a canonical map to OS. Okay, so just view this as a, just add this kind of stupid term here in the, at the end. Why there is no tr minus one term? And hmm? There are no tr minus one term in the direct summon. Yeah, yeah, so, because I forgot that. And so this tells you also in this case here, this a, a and beta that I wrote, it's just a union of nested Hilbert schemes. Okay, so, and so here the nesting, um, so we have this, this parameters, uh, so n, um, I don't know if I should give you a definition, so this is, would be just, just the sub schemes um, inside ER and then inside OS where this EI, EJs will be just ideal sheaves of points um, of length NJ, and then you tensor with the O of minus a beta J. Okay? And so then with this convention, there's a certain constraint you have. So you have beta zero plus beta R is equal to beta. And in our case, the, the last one will be just the ideal sheaf of this eta. So, so this beta R will be just zero. And then you have a second constraint here, the sum over the nr, and well, my notation should be like the summation over ni plus one half beta i, I square is equal to, I, I forgot, so n minus r times d or something, okay? And so, so once you have that, so that's kind of the first observation. You just, you don't need to construct a new kind of crazy model space, you just work with the nested Hilbert scheme again. And then step two is this cosection. Okay, so cosection. And so th th what you prove is that the following. So, so now let's look at this our guy here. Um, so this is our uh, fixed part of our obstruction theory. Okay, uh, restricted to this restricted to this loci. Now what you can prove is the following. This is just a cone of the following guys, so this is a direct sum for our home of EI, EI, mapping to the direct sum over our home of EI, EI plus one. And then you put a trace-free part here. And then you have to get the sum and rights, so it matters here. So some take the deformations of the first Rs, and then here these ones you go from actually zero to R minus one. So if I put here R, then you get just a rank, I mean, the theory for respect to D equals to zero, but here we put R minus one because we did this cut. So, and, and so here, this zero here, let me just define this. And so here, this R home, EI, EI, zero is the cone over R gamma of S O S. R gamma over E i sorry R home um, and then the same thing also for this E i plus one thing is the cone of the same guy here mapping first to the same guy here and then continuing with this natural inclusion with respect to E i E i plus one. And so yeah, I can attribute this to, I mean, Golampur, Seshmani, and Yao, and also, I guess, Golampur, Thomas. And then, I mean, it's really not uh, an epsilon square or something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, now I don't have any time anymore, I guess, right? So I want to draw final, I mean, the final thing we have to do is just take the, um, understand this long exact sequence associated to this thing to find our cosection. Once we have that, then, then we're done. Okay, so, so let's just take cohomology of this. Okay, so now we are hunting a second cosection of this thing. So take cohomology. long exact sequence. And it's really kind of a beautiful 
a nice thing to do because you learn a lot about the nested Hilbert schemes by just taking this, staring at this. Okay, so, um, so the trace-free part, if you take uh, the H0 of this term, you get home of EI, EI, that's just C because the EI are ideal sheets, so they're stable, so it's just C. And then the trace-free part, just um, the identity is killed out by this cone. So this first term is zero, and here you really get the Holmes model of this identity. So, so you get the first term here is the Holm, Holm of this EI, EI plus one, quotient out C times this, this natural inclusion. Let me just write Fi for an inclusion from EI to EI plus one. Okay, so this is the first term. Uh, goes to goes to R minus one. So this maps to the x1 here um, of this EE, um, zero fix, okay? And so this term here really just describes you to, I mean, kind of tells you how to move. So, so the EI and the EI plus one differ by a curve, and some of this, this, uh, this group tells you how to move that curve, or curve around. Okay, so this is this term. And then the next term is, uh, um, yeah, so we, we're here, then we're going here, and then the next term is here, so this is just the direct sum of this x i's, of this e i, e i, where i goes from zero to r. Okay. And so this is also very natural because um, this just tells you how to, and when you have a deformation of the nested Hilbert scheme, it induces you a deformation of each of the individual members of the sheaves. So if you deform the whole thing, you also deform the individual ones. This this map. And then the next one here is the x1 of this EI, EI plus one. And then here you have the zero. And then you have ER minus one. Okay. And what is this map here? This kind of an interesting map. And let me just draw you one picture. So you have a deformation. Say you have a guy here. Say a guy a topo here. That gives you a deformation of the first sheaf, I mean, one sheaf and another sheaf. Um, so let's say you're given a tuple, alpha i, that just gives you a collection of deformation of the individual sheaves. And then you have this natural inclusions here. And essentially, this, this guy here just sends you to the corresponding um, condition that makes this diagram commute. So now I have to be careful. It's like fi, alpha i minus this j plus f, or something like that. The guy in the middle is not crispy. Hmm? The guy in the middle is not crispy. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to describe you this map. Yeah. So here, yeah. And so finally, you, you end up with this obstruction space. Yeah. Okay, so now comes the punchline of the talk. So, so where's the cosection? And so this is really by trying to understand this, 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 this sequence also. So let's just try to understand it. And, um, and so here we really took this R gamma. And here, uh, I mean, H1 of S or S is zero. So let's start at this, this first term here. So we have the sequence X x1 of ei, ei plus 1. Um, and uh, so you, you go to this x1 of ei, ei plus 1 to the trace free part. And then you go around, you go to this h2. And then you continue, you have x2. Uh, and then you go to the x2 of this guy, which will be 0. Uh, and then 0. Okay. And so now just uh, so the, the punchline comes in this, this thing to observe that this is just the home of ei plus 1 comma ei by set duality dual. So in particular, this is, this is c if ei is equal to if you are the same and zero if they are different. Okay, so if they are strictly contained in each other. 
So in particular, if they're different, um, this guy is zero, and so this means this is subjective if, if, the, if they are different. Okay. So if they're different, it means if you go to zero here, they are subjective, so then you really have a map to this, to this trivial piece. And so then what you see is that you get a map here to basically direct sum over all the eyes where, where you're different. Uh, H2 OS, so these are trivial summons. Then you show that this factors to it here, and then, then you win. Okay, so the upshot is that in the end, in the end, so the corollary is that this, this, this guy here, uh, and better. So this this is zero if if the number of um, under if indices where these two things are are different. The um, is, is bigger than one. Okay, so if there are more than two steps in this filtration, then you, you get a zero. And so, um, yeah, so, so from this you, I mean, you just do some calculation and then, uh, and then, then, yeah, you get this. And you get, I mean, it's kind of beautiful. You get uh, from this geometric argument, you get the sign and you get this, this factor and then, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. Okay, maybe I stop because uh, I already over, I'm already over time. Questions? You can, uh, so mm. you get this for the Igusa class. We have this S three symmetry, right, which can lift to the right category. Yes. I guess the multiple cover you can express by the hacker operator. Yes, you can, can do that. Can you lift that to the right category? You mean this S three action? No, I mean the hacker. Ah, to the drive category. I mean, uh, no, because somehow, th yeah. So this this uh, strictly does not come from a derived equivalence because somehow, um, yeah. I mean, the invariants which are preserved. Uh, I mean, so for example, this this a certain invariance you can write down for this. Let's say beta one minus n one. You can write down invariants which are preserved under derived equivalences and which are different. So, so you can write down a certain number here, a certain number here, and you, they are different. If, 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 for example, if this one is, um, if this has a divisor, and this one doesn't, if the GCD of the second one is uh, is one, and the GCD of this one is two, then you can write down an invariant that tells you that. There's no, I mean, which is a derived equivalence invariant. So, which, so you can never take the one to the other. Okay, so, yeah, so derived equivalence will not help you prove the multiple cover conjecture. Is it easy to describe this invariant? Yeah, it's easy to describe this invariant. Sorry for not doing it. So, so the, yeah, so the way you do it is you look at this, um, look at the integral cohomology, and you decompose it as like homology of K3 surface times this class of a point on the elliptic curve plus and then if you have a vector here so this I mean if you have some guy here um, in, in the here then you just take the, the, the wedge of this and you take the GCD of this wedge and at least okay so there's I mean there's a slide uh, Slide lie hidden here, so it's not uh, the outer group of outer equivalences of K three times elliptic curve is not known. I think it's even not known for K three surface. So, but under the natural ones, I mean the, the ones coming from outer equivalences of the K three surface and the, the ones from the elliptic curve, you can prove that this is this quantity is just preserved under outer equivalences. And so, yeah. yeah. So the higher rank is that's. Yeah, so the high rank is not a talk. So, <laughs> but yeah, I think this is also. I mean, I think there's like, yeah, I think three different approaches to it. So, I think one of them will work. So I have a question with multiplicity too, because Eugene was also wondering in chat. Um, the fact that 
these nested, nested sheep, nested ideals come up just like in Richard's uh, heading for the cotangent bundle of S. So is that just a consequence of the fact that you're using the same methods or is there a connection between the, the geometries? You mean that you get the same, I mean in... So you have S times E and he has the cotangent bundle of S. Yeah, I mean S times E, I mean if you think, I mean we have we have surface, I mean, we have surface times P1 and we really look at surface times A1 and that is just a cotangent, uh, I mean, the canonical, total space of canonical bundle of this on the K3 surface because canonical bundle is trivial. So my question is the fact that you can reduce to S times P1 is something that you haven't showed us and then it, it leads to the same things that... Uh, exactly, exactly, yeah. And this reduction to S cross P1, I'm, I can refer to uh, Pandre Pandre's lecture next week. So, so then it's, it's no surprise that the same thing should happen. Yes, it's not surprising. Yeah. I mean, what was surprising a little bit for me is that this, this issue with here can be solved so easily, but maybe this was just my stupidity. So. Could you explain briefly why components B and C doesn't contribute? <coughs> yeah, so... So here, the, so here really, the, um, if you calculate this, then the x2 really splits as a sum of two x2. So for this component, ah, sorry, for this upstairs, really splits uh, so of EE, and um, maybe splits up to, maybe there's some factor, but uh, let me make a small lie here, okay? So it's essentially the same as, the obstruction spaces to these guys, and maybe you have to worry that this, they match on both sides, where this is the ideal sheet for this guy. And so then you have a cosection here, and you have a cosection here, and they're independent. And so then you have, again, two cosections, so this doesn't contribute. And here it's really a dimension argument that somehow the reduced virtual dimension of this surface times P1 is, is 2D plus 1, and here this rubber just has a virtual class of dimension 2D. So there's some dimension argument that, that we don't need this. So this is actually, yeah, this is kind of, kind of lucky that this doesn't contribute. Any other questions? So you, you have this insertion of degree one. Uh, how did you particularly choose the insertion? Ah, I chose this by tau zero. Or you choose wh why I chose this okay. one. Why do you expect much to cover? For, for this I mean, you can choose to choose a different one, and essentially you can re-express it in terms of this one. There's a different way to if you write everything in, when you quotient out your model space by the elliptic curve, um, and then yeah. So essentially, it doesn't matter which one you take. I mean, yeah. In some sense, this the, this is the the natural one from several perspective, but it's not. Yeah. There's nothing particular about it. There's a, somehow a single number that you can attach to this model space, and that's. That's this one. Well, to find if you're reduced dt of x, you make a choice of beta dual such that beta beta dual equal one. Yeah, and it doesn't depend on which one you take. Uh, okay, it vanishes when you reduce to the relative theory that beta dual sum. I mean, you have. I mean, I didn't talk about insertions. That's kind of also a different story. So you have to, you have to, yeah, deal with. Yeah, we deal with these ins insertions that you, you take. And here, the surface times P1 relative to zero, it's not Calabiao. So this one is not Calabiao. It has the, this has reduced virtual dimension 2D plus 1. So in fact, you need a lot of, lot of insertions here. And I just sweep them under the rug. So. Do you expect a similar story in the Gromovitan side that you can reduce the non-primitive reduced Gromovitan theory of K three times e to primitive in terms of primitive. Yeah, so I mean, if on the Gromovitan side, you can just use the product formula and just reduce to Gromovitan theory, reduce this question to Gromovitan theory of K three surface, and there is a conjecture for exactly that. Uh, that I mean, any Gromovitan theory of uh, any Gromovitan invariant of a K three surface in, imp in primitive class can be reduced to primitive class, and um, that conjecture, I mean, I can refer to as Tim. Uh, to Tim because he proved it in divisibility too. So, but in in, in in the general case, that's kind of a open question. 
So the expansion for a different point for the, for the inverse. So that's related then to the higher rank? Yeah, that's related to the higher rank.